Julian, we were actually we did, we were recording a little Patreon episode before you got in here. Oh, really? And um, we were watching the video of those deans at Harvard talking about they're saying the gen of Jews is not considered hate speech That's at right. your university. That's She's like, right. well, not unless you co conduct the right. The the, the, you have to actually commit it, which I pointed out in the tweet. I was like, so it's impossible for an individual or even like a campus to have a genocide, right? And genocide is removal of all the people on earth, right? right? exactly. But you can call for it, right? Mm -hmm. We can call for the, you know, I would never do this, but, you know, Armenians should not be, you know, people from Tennessee should not be allowed to exist, those, those shiftless Tennesseans, mm. right? Um, and if you're doing that, yeah, so it's that, that speech. But then they're saying that that speech is okay as long as you don't actually go out and kill everyone from Tennessee. But imagine trying to, so could you kill anybody? You know, no, it's, it's really not. It's a strong moral, complete moral cowardice. I mean, universities have gotten so rotten. Did you see what Dave Portnoy said about that? He, he, no. he, Dave Portnoy came out and he said that he, I think he went on one of the shows on TV and he's basically like, I'm no longer going to, uh, we're not going to hire any students from those universities until those deans step down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I was, you know, going around saying it's it's actually a good thing. My university is very prestigious, but it's not as prestigious as Harvard. Mm. Um, and that's a good thing because the more prestigious the university, the more the president wants to keep her job. And the more she wants to keep her job, the more dangerous it is for the university. So these universities forget about that they've lost donations and stuff like that. Those universities have a combined $120 billion endowment. They don't need donations. They need, you know, like if you give them $100 million, their their net worth goes up by, you know, one, <laughs> one right. tenth of 1%, right? So this is not something that really affects them. But So what is going on with that? Like why are they doing I, this? I think that they are so incredibly beholden to not offending, you know, which I think is very demeaning towards Muslims. That they can't say that these certain things are off limits and you can't say certain types of speech. Just like Jews wouldn't go around and saying we call for the you know complete ex uh, liquidation of all Palestinians from Israel. I mean, right. It's not something we would ever condone. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, it's called making uh, principles of your community. Like you can have free speech. By the way, free speech applies to the government. The government of the United States cannot impinge upon your free speech and my free speech. They can't compel us to say stuff. But campuses compel us to say stuff all the time because it's a it's not a free speech you know it's not truly subject to the First Amendment because they're not the government even at a public university like mine, and then that people try to say well no they get government funding but there are a lot of professors that don't get government funding so what do you do in that situation? Right. They can inhibit free speech very easily they by basically you basically can lose your livelihood or you can lose your job or your tenure okay. or whatever. It's yeah. the same thing with the internet. People self censor because they don't want to be kicked off YouTube. That's right. Yeah. So the the more prestigious you are, the less likely it is that you would be uh, able to do any other job in life. This woman, Claudine Gay, I mean, first of all, for her scholarship, she's the president of Harvard. You keep saying dean, and um, oh, just she's to correct dean? you, it'd be like me saying, you know, like, <laughs> you know, this is just a little YouTube channel, right? This is a huge YouTube channel. Like, you're the you know, founder. Although I have to say, when I was invited on the show, it was called Concrete. So I'm yes, a little, it was. now it's not called Concrete. Yes, anymore. and we have more than 10,000 subscribers. So you, Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think you have a lot more than ten thousand. So yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, but no 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 the uh, the 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 d titles are very important for academics. See, we don't get paid that much. We don't get in you know too much fame. We don't get too much attention. You know, some get more than others, but academics really rely on one type of currency for their existence, for their self gratification, and that's how many times they get cited by other eggheaded academics like me. And to do what the president has been accused of, and it seems very credible. In fact, she's already going back and retracting this, these these papers, and having them re-edited. It's very it, it's very scary, right? Because mm -hmm. there used to be a saying in the Soviet Union. I don't know if you ever saw those pictures, like Lenin and Stalin, or this Trotsky, this other guy on a bridge, and like in the 1930s. And then they redid this picture, and they just they edited out this guy. But in the 1930s, and it looks flawless as if you did it with Photoshop. But of mm -hmm. course. You know, so 80 years before Photoshop existed. Wow. So they just, and that, so in the Soviet Union, there was a joke. They used to say the, the future is known, that communism is the future, the future is bright and glorious, but the past was always changing. So they'd go back and erase things from history. So literally what she's having these journals do, which is unprecedented, in some cases, decades later, the president of Harvard, I, don't, I couldn't get this done. I'm just a lowly, you know, uh, t tenured professor, right? 
The president of Harvard has convinced the journals that publish her academic papers, which are now being cited for plagiarism, that there's a claim that she plagiarized, she stole work from other people, which is which is fine to do, not even stealing. If you quote it and you say, Brian Keating wrote this, Danny Jones wrote that, and you put quotes around it. But if you say like, you know, your your greatest hit, buying a Lamborghini for four point one million dollars, you know, whatever. Like, and I just put a, like I change it. And I put Brian Keating video buying a Lamborghini. I get all the cr- that's wrong. That's objectively intellectually dishonest. But then to have YouTube go back and erase that you made that video, that you did this interview with CIA spy or a NASA, you know, uh, 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 whistleblower. If you were to do that and go back and just erase you that you never did it, I did it. It's it's very scary. It's mm. rewriting of history. And yeah. What else do we have? We don't have our memories and our history. So yeah. it's a very de- a depressing time to be an academic. In part, that's that was the reason that I wanted to, you know, uh, play around with what Jordan Peterson is doing with the Peterson Academy. Hey, everybody. I just want to drop in to remind you all to please hammer the subscribe button below the video. That is the one thing that makes this channel and these podcasts grow and enables us to keep making more of them, flying in guests all over the world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Thank you to everybody who has been subscribing. It has been helping a lot. The reach has been growing. We're now up to like 60% of the viewers of these podcasts are subscribed. There's still like 40, 45% who are not yet subscribed. So if you're a regular watcher of the channel and you enjoy these podcasts and you want to help, all I ask is that you just hammer that subscribe button below these videos. Thank you again. I love you all. Back to the show. Which is a for-profit university, but with a cost- of, to the consumer of less than 10% of a traditional university degree and accredited eventually. Although not yet, there are all these weird chicken or egg things. Like you have to graduate a college class. Like you have, to, people have to get their degree from Peterson Academy or this new university, Austin, Texas. They have to get their degree before the university itself becomes an official university. Does that make sense? Mm, so they of. won't be accredited. I don't know if you went to college or not, but no. you know, I went to college. I went to undergraduate. That was an accredited undergraduate institution. I got my degree, Bachelor of Science, and and so on. I went to get my PhD, also accredited. Mm-hmm. For new universities, it's it's a little trickier. You have to go through certain certain hoops, for legislation, so that just everybody can't open their own university and and give charge people for tuition for degrees. Right, right. So yeah, so academia has been uh, really under attack. I mean, it's it's. It's been bad for a long time. This so-called diversity, equity, and inclusion, or as I call it, diversity, inclusion, and equity, and that makes the acronym DIE, um, is uh, is a you know it is a impingement upon free speech. So for these people to all of a sudden dis- discover the newfound love for free speech, it's kind of uh, it's kind of surprising because some of these people were the some of the most suppressive of ideas that they disagreed with, yeah, and controlled the speech on campus extremely extremely strictly until October seventh, and when October seventh happened. And Jews were massacred in their beds in kibbutzim and and their you know toddlers were kidnapped for the first time in war. There's no record of of babies. There's a baby who's a couple of months old right. is in captivity in, in Hamas territory in, right. in Gaza. Never happened in human warfare, modern warfare, and that this is acceptable. And the day after this happened on my campus and other campuses, students celebrated. They actually uh, were were concerned about the people of Gaza and Palestinians, and said that the martyrs had done great good, meaning the Hamas terrorists. Really? People on your campus, yeah, on my campus. What were yeah. they doing specifically? So they said they had rallies in support of the quote unquote martyrs. These are students for justice in Palestine. They're called. They're on every campus, many many campuses. Uh, some campuses have actually evicted them and removed them. Columbia University, wow. Brandeis, recently Rutgers University has banned them from campus. Um, they have different affiliations, some with groups like CARE, which is uh, found to be extremely problematic in its support for the October 7th um, uh, terror attacks. Anyway, so these uh, campuses have become really intolerant. In fact, at my campus at UC San Diego, uh, we had a rally outside of the student senate, so the undergraduates voting on whether or not they should condemn anti-Semitism. In other words, all your fellow students go, gather around and they said, we want to make a condemnation because there's been so much anti-Semitism since and before October 7th. We had a swastika written in human feces in one of our dormitories at UC San Diego. Um, this was b- almost barely mentioned during uh, what they, you know, these students for justice in Palestine have a week every year and they 
call Israel an apartheid state and other slanders against Israel. Uh, but anyway, they had they had this event and that happened that swastika. I'm not saying it was created by them, mm. but uh, it happened at the time when they have these uh, events on campus. So the student senators decided we're going to have a forum, a referendum, and just say we condemn anti-Semitism. Well, outside that meeting, there were students wearing kafiyas, the Palestinian garb, and mm-hmm. and others, and they hoisted the flag of ISIS. They f- hoisted the, the the shahada, the flag that represents ISIS, Islamic State, um, in front of where these senators, none, to my knowledge, none of them are actually Jewish. They're, some of them are Asian. Some of them are you know Latin American. Some of them are whatever. None of them are Jewish, but they hosted this, hoisted this flag in front of where they were holding this meeting. Clearly meant to intimidate. Nothing was done to them. You can come to meetings now wearing full head coverings unless you wear the wrong one. So you can wear a f- complete kafia that covers your head. But I guarantee you if somebody showed up with the KKK clan hood, uh, they would be escorted immediately as they should be. Right. You know, you don't have to host people in your campus. If I came into the studio and I said, my First Amendment right has, has me be able to say whatever I want and start to talk about the KKK, this is a private organization. You don't have to do the kind of certain principles that protect your decorum and what you expect of people that come on here and come into your your private place of business or even in public spaces. So yeah. campuses have become real kind of uh, centers for a lot of extreme repugnant views and not just, you know, and very far away from what academia is supposed to be and why I became a professor. It, always, it makes me wonder too, when you look at history and, and you like, are, are, how much are these students being influenced by where where is their influence coming from? You know, you always wonder, like, is it coming from an outside influence just trying to sow chaos within the United States? Do these people really believe this? Because these people are so disconnected from what's going on in that part of the world. Yeah. Like, they have no fucking clue. No. We live, we live, we're surrounded by 6,000 miles of ocean in both directions. Like, mm-hmm. we have it so good here. Yeah, so good here, and yeah. you can't begin to fathom what it must be like to live in that part of the world that's just been torn by r- r- war and religion for so fucking long. Yeah, no, and you look at it and you see people, you know, protesting the LGBTQ, or you know, organizations protesting on behalf of Hamas. I mean, these these are things that don't make sense because. Their views are antithetical. Like, try finding when was the last Pride Parade held in Gaza? Like, just look up, look that up <laughs> right. and chat. It's never That's happened, funny. right? Whereas in Israel, Israel's a parliamentary democracy, so they have vote. They have they have all different parties. They have an Arab party. There's Arabs on their Supreme Court, meaning Palestinians. They're they're people that are uh, Israeli citizens right, that right. serve in their military. I was just there in September. I spent time with a man whose father is a 26. He's a Bedouin, Muslim Bedouin, <laughs> uh, from Tiberias, and his father's been in the IDF for 26 years. No problem. There, he's Muslim, devout, practicing Muslims. Okay, that, to say that there's like ethnic cleansing and apartheid—it's just such a lie. In South Africa in the 1970s, they didn't have blacks in the parliament. They didn't have a parliament that has a, a LGBTQ party. There's a party <laughs> of that. There are parties of atheists. There are parties that are religious. It's one of the most diverse and multicultural yeah. societies on earth, and it's in the most dangerous part of, of the world. And the Jews have lived in complete, you know, kind of abject, you know, fear for, for decades. And this is not to s- deny the Palestinians should have a land of their own. I've never claimed that. I've never said that, that they shouldn't. Uh, but on the, by the same token, you look at, you know, things on October 6th versus October 7th, how could you possibly, you know, see how you could make make an agreement to live in peace side by side with these you know people from Palestinian territories who now support there are more supporters I read yesterday of Hamas in the West Bank than in Gaza by really? by a proportionate amount yeah so this is the these are the people that Israel's going to attempt to make peace with I think it's going to be extremely challenging I think Israel had huge breakdowns in their society and internally but their democracy and these things will get worked out probably Netanyahu will be gone um but uh, but the campus culture has gotten so uh, it's it's become so virulent. These ideas, like you were mentioning, mm. that they propagate in a mind virus. That things you could not get someone to believe in unless they were an intellectual. Uh, there was a, a phrase that that uh, you know that uh, Lenin used to use called uh, "useful idiots," yeah. where there'd be people that could do good because they were they were stupid and easily duped. Yeah. But I came up with a phrase that's called uh, "useless geniuses." <laughs> we have all these brilliant people on campus, like the father of string theory. Maybe we'll get into it, or one of the modern fathers of string theory, Edward Witten. Yeah. For the la- until October seventh, or till just this summer. 
he had his Twitter feed. And if you looked at his Twitter feed, essentially every single tweet about it was about how evil Israel is and how just the Palestinians are and how they, you know, Israel is, is a, basically an apartheid state. All Who the is this thing. you're talking about? Edward Witten. This is Ed's, Ed he has a Twitter? And it's Twitter. I he has a Twitter. That. Yeah. And so I made jokes like, no wonder string theory hasn't made any progress in decades, you know, because there's this guy who was the you know, foremost proponent and champion of string theory, and he's obsessed with his, and he's a Jew, he's obsessed with the, with the, you know, alleged atrocities that Israel is committing. He's gone silent. He's gone completely silent. So I've hoped for string theory. Maybe string theory is about to make a revolution because Edward, Wood, maybe he's gotten back his moral, uh, uh, you know, intellectual ability yeah. back. But until then, the, he was called a lot of times the smartest man on earth yeah and he believed things that were just completely just absolute just nonsense and and it takes sometimes an intellectual to believe such things that's funny we so before you got here i told you we were doing this little patreon episode and uh i called up jack sarfati and i said oh, jack he's a good friend of mine oh, now I after know, i went yeah, over, i went and yeah. visited him he's a he's a I wish there was more people like him. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll have to, well, you'll have I to said, Jack, exp I watched 10 videos on string theory this morning. Can you explain to me what string theory is better than any of these YouTube videos can? His answer was, it's bullshit. It's bullshit. Right. It's, it's art. It's mathematical art. I saw his <laughs> you confirm or deny that? Um, uh, Jack, Jack's a problematic person in a lot of ways. Uh, he's extremely, uh, he's extremely obstreperous. I mean, he, he loves to cause trouble. He <laughs> copies me on emails. I've asked him to remove me a hundred times. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, how do you possibly expect to revolutionize technology and, and physics if you don't understand how to use BCC? I would just love that. Term. <laughs> and one of my friends who, I won't say who it is. So every time Jack sends an email, this guy sends him a link to like donate to Kamala Harris reelection. <laughs> <laughs> oh no that's, a, that's hilarious because this guy is so he's asked him four times the guy won't do it and then there's always a new thread and he changes his email address so it's like every mm. every day this guy's getting a new email from him I actually have a block so I get, I've blocked all his emails so Jack if you're out there you know try harder my, my friend oh, my I think God. he was at UC San Diego before he, he was went to, he went yeah. to UC San Diego yeah he got his degree there and he's, he's always not, not, his, not his PhD but he got his master's in physics from there yeah um, so I have no record of anything that he's done in the last 25 years or more even that I haven't gotten back I believe that he was mentioned in this book by my good friend David Kaiser called How the Hippies Save Physics yes um, to what extent his contributions are really you know recognized you know I think you can look at who have gone you know these these awards who gets citations what papers have been published what journals and just the way that he communicates I think is really obnoxious and the way that he criticizes my very good friend you know Eric Weinstein he's an idiot he's a schmuck podcast, called him an idiot and a schmuck I think <laughs> You uh, call that to me. He calls me that almost every time I talk to him. Yeah, I mean, it's, well, you don't have to be uh, around him, right? You know, you're yeah. not in the field as the same <laughs> right. field as him. Right. But uh, everyone's an idiot compared to him. So if yes, you, you know, exactly. You, that is, they and say, that though, is a fact, by the way. Yeah, Jack. They say. Let me give you a tip. They say you're the average of the five people you're around the most. <laughs> so, <laughs> all of the around you is an idiot. You're the idiot. It's like the, <laughs> the fool at the poker table. But, you know, God bless him. He, he can do his thing. But look, the difference between these guys is drink theorist and, and Eric Weinstein and Brian Green and Michio Kaku, who, who Julian, our, our mutual friend, um, has had on. They're all theorists. Okay, so they're working on theories that are by nature provisional. Every single theory is provisional. The theory of evolution is provisional. The theory of plate tectonics is provisional. In other words, it could change. I always like to bring up this idea. Like, do you believe the Earth is a sphere? I don't know if you've had flat earthers on the show. I have, unfortunately. I should have. Yeah, I should have done my due diligence before. Uh, I know but, it. Fly, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no so, I know it's not. A, it's not a perfect sphere. It's like a flywheel. Um, well, it's it's the it's equator's like wider. It's, yes, exactly. It bulges at the equator. It's a little narrow at the pole. So it's kind of like a pair it's a little weird shape but um but if you believe that it's it's flat you're more wrong than someone who believes it's a sphere even though you're both are wrong technically right yeah. to, ex to explain you actually need to involve these things called spherical harmonics and even those will have some deficiency in capturing the accurate shape of the of the of the or, you know planet itself but um there's degrees of being less wrong and then there are classifications of people you say that are not even wrong a famous quote from uh, wolfgang Pauli. uh so the, the question is can a theorist really make progress? The answer is no. A theorist can't do anything, can't do crap by themselves sitting in a room. Because for a very important re reason, you may think it is the job of, a th of an experimental physicist like me or a theoretical physicist to prove something. Uh, but actually, 
proof in physics is completely impossible. Any physical science is impossible. There's only two subjects you can prove something in. One is called logic or philosophy, and the other is math. Math can actually have a theorem, like one plus one equals two, mm -hmm. and it will take 200 pages to prove it from different you know, category theory, group theory, set theory, and you can prove it multiple ways. You could prove Pythagorean theorem in, I think, 300 different ways you can prove it. But you can't prove a theory of physics, right? If I say the um, evolution is true, all I have to do is find one counter, counter I'm not saying this exists, of Lamarckian genetic traits, and, and actually some of it you know, was, was thought to be very plausible, say, or that you, know, you find some type of creature that doesn't use DNA and only uses RNA or some triple, I don't know, I'm making it up, but, but the point is one counterexample can falsify something that was previously believed to be true like Newtonian gravity, like Einsteinian gravity. We don't even think Einstein's the final word, right? There's no final word because there's no proof in physical sciences. There's only proof in a mathematical, abstract, abstruse sense, mm. as it is, say, in mathematics and, in, and in, in philosophy. So for physicists, it gives them great angst. Theoretical physicists know that not only is it not possible for their theory to be proven, it may not even be testable. And this is the problem with theories like that of people like Michio Kaku, Brian Greene, or... Edward Witten, string theory, or Jack. I can't look into Jack's theories without getting a, haircut, a, a headache. <laughs> <laughs> but, he, said, he says, challenge any of these schmucks to debate the Salfati. They're all scared. Oh, yeah, right. You know, so I, no, no one will debate him. That's his yeah. problem. No, I'll, I'll quote what I, uh, what I was told uh, once uh, that uh, Richard Dawkins said when he was asked to challenge someone who doesn't believe in evolution. He says, I could see how that would be an outstanding addition to your CV. <laughs> <laughs> but you can understand how it would be an absolutely horrendous one for mine, right? Right, So right. Jack's uh, completely, you know, no, no one's going to debate him. No one's going to, because, actually, because of the They don't want to be associated he, with him? They don't want to be associated with him. They don't take him seriously. I actually joke. I say, like, somebody comes up with it. Because, actually, Eric Weinstein's called me up a lot recently asking about, like, my thoughts on Grush. And, you know, I actually haven't done my due diligence on it. I've been so busy the last couple of weeks, but it's something I'm going to have time, maybe even talk to Grush at some point. But um, but I always ask Eric or whoever I talk to, or they have some new theory, I say, what's the Sarfati number? You know, like how far away from complete abject unfalsifiability, just like I cat there first, I came up with this, and just the kind of grandiosity mm -hmm. that people like Jack will have. Mm -hmm. And there's many of them. I yeah, get emails I from bet. them every day. Um, you know, Professor Keating, you're wrong. Everybody's wrong. I'm right. Let me come on the pro uh, talk podcast. Um, let me let me write a paper with you. I'm not good in math. I mean, Jack's probably good in math, but uh, they'll say I'm not good in math. But if you help me out, we'll share the Nobel Prize. And you know, and for you know, I don't blame these people for having passion about these different phenomena. But look, if I asked you, you know, Daniel, I said to you, look. Which is more important? Let's say let's say Grush is right. There, there is something, and I don't know. I actually don't know which because I think you're you do an outstanding job. You don't really kind of tip your hand at what you truly believe. You're not dogmatic. You're kind of curious. You want to hear the answer. Um, uh, and and you know, for me, if I asked you just point blank, I said, let's say Grush is right. What do you think is the technology that allowed these spacecraft to get? Here he's claiming, as far as I understand it, he hasn't seen. And you cor please correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't follow this nearly as close as you do. Um, but he's claiming that there are people in the government, our U.S. government, that have covered up the landing of of spacecraft with bodies inside, with some type of biologics. He's called them mm -hmm. in, in congressional testimony. Um, um, I've had on Ryan Graves on my podcast, who's a, a former F-18 pilot. We've he's been here too. Yeah. Yeah. And he's great. And he's a very sweet guy. And I believe, you know, he's earnest in his mission, what he's trying to accomplish. Um, and he hasn't said though, you know, he, he, he did never said that he saw these craft, these spheres and stuff. Yes, cubes. exactly. So he said that he knows the pilots and they would not only see them, they'd see them every day, every deployment. Every, so, and Fravor claims he saw this tic tac. Let's just say they're all real. There's some kernel of truth god tells you here danny boom they're true there's tic tacs there's crash saucers there's biologics there's cubes with spheres and spheres with cubes what if i asked you danny what was the technology that was more important to those aliens to get here was it string theory or was it metallurgy what would you say it is what technology enabled it more like if you just had a guess was it something like string theory or was it something like metallurgy? I would say something like metallurgy. Yeah. I mean, it's much more practical, right? There's nothing about string theory necessarily that involves anything that's a necessary condition for those aliens to get here. And yet you have people like Jack and like others that you need this warp drive and you need this theory of physics and Eric's theory of geometric unity is wrong because this is... A 
uh, to, a- to answer this question usually presupposes the fact that these distances are enormous, which is true. I mean, these distances are enormous. But the age of the universe is also quite enormous, right? So if you imagine um, that these craft have been traveling, if they exist, and I'm not saying I actually don't think they exist, right? You know, so so I, I'd rather you know kind of defend that. But I think to be an intellectual and to be honest, you have to say, look, let's give the other side steel man the, your opponent's argument and see if that sharpens up your own. So from my perspective, when people result as Dave Grush has that these things are holograms and they travel at the, you know, faster than the speed of light and they can manipulate space time. I've heard him when he was on Joe Rogan speculating about this, tying in these loose notions of quantum mechanics and relativity and warp drives and, and all these other things. Um, he's a physicist too, isn't he, Grush? No. No, I think I thought he had a degree in physics. <clears throat> he might have a bachelor's degree or something. Right. That doesn't mean he's a physicist. Yeah, and he's not a pilot. I mean, right, he's not right, right. Right. Um, And I don't think that those things necessarily like favor. Oh, well, you're doubting a U.S. Navy veteran. I'm like, he has more bigger balls than I do, but that doesn't mean he's like better observer and analytic when it comes to data analysis. He did an eyewitness thing. You know, probably most courts, you know, <laughs> eyewitness reports are replete with being completely erroneous, mis- misinterpreted. You know, they have famous studies where there's like the Stanford studies, a gorilla dribbling a basketball, like between all these other people. And you're, you're just counting how many ba- times somebody dribbles a basketball and a gorilla goes through. Nobody notices the gorilla. I mean, the, the fact that human beings are not considered the, as reliable as other forms of evidence in many situations leads me to say that like, yeah, I'm just as qualified. I'm not, again, I don't have the balls that David Fravor, Ryan Graves have my friend, Ariel Kleinerman. I've had on all these guys. I haven't on David Fravor, uh, Alex Dietrich. I mean, I'm like, she doesn't have big balls, whatever she has big ovaries. <laughs> I'm not, uh, I don't have the courage. I didn't have the, the physical mental abilities to be a pilot at their level. I fly little Cessnas around, but, um, Okay, so I stipulate that. But th- does that mean that you just trust whatever they say? I mean, are we in the stance? Are we going to take the stance that someone in the government is to be trusted? I mean, I, I always thought that the government is to be is to be suspicious of. Right? right. They covered up Roswell. They covered up all these things. Right. The Kennedy assassination. So you can't have it both ways. I mean, at some point you have to look and say, what do the data tell us right now? And I'm always surprised on my channel how many people just assume that I'm working for big astronomy or there's some like, you know, conspiracy that I'm a part of that like, because I am skeptical of the existence. Oh, look, I'm, I'll be honest. I'm skeptical, not only of the existence of alien technology, I'm s- fairly suspicious of the existence of alien life, which is a prerequisite for alien intelligence and technology. Right? So, and I've made arguments for that. When I was on Joe Rogan and Lex Friedman. Um, and, but I'm not the final word either, you know, so caveat emptor. Hmm. Why don't you believe that there is alien life or any, you say, you said, you have said before that you don't believe that there is alien life or intelligent alien life because- uh, I, I'm careful about it. I don't, I don't say I don't believe. Like I say, I don't believe in gravity you don't, either. Evidence. There's no yeah. evidence. That's right. <clears throat> right. But people like Jack Sarfati would say that there is evidence and they've seen it. And it's not something you can measure and test in a laboratory with beakers. It's something that you have to see. It's intelligence. It's police. It's investigative work. It's police work. Like it's, it's something that scientists aren't going to have access to and they won't be able to measure and detect, but it's something that exists because they've seen it and they know, they know that, you know, if you have a security clearance or whatever it might be, it's, it's verifiable okay. and, it's, and it's there. So I ask you, are you, are you Christian? Um, no, I'm not really like religious. Though. You don't believe in God or I mean, I, be- I believe in God. I haven't really explored it too right. much. I, I, be- I, I believe in something. Yeah. I don't follow us. I don't follow a strict faith. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. You're not a practice. You don't, right, you don't I don't practice. practice. Right, right, right. Um, fine. But, um, but you know, people that believe the existence of Jesus Christ, not only based on the testimonies of the new Testament, but also because they've had personal revelation or they've been sa- saved salvation from by the works of Jesus that they ascribe to Jesus. Right. Um, would you uh, uh, would you attribute those scientifically in any way? Would you say that their their personal revelation of Christ, you know, in their deepest darkest moments, they're at the bottom of a bottle, or they're at the top of the world when they have a baby, or whatever? Do you, is that a scientific claim or is that a faith claim? It's not scientific. 
Right. So in that sense, that's okay because faith is one thing and, and science is another thing. These things that they're talking about that they've seen with their eyes or they've experienced and there's some, you know, cover, those are also, now they're, they're not only faith, but they're also saying they're scientific. If you're making a claim that there's, there's objects and those objects have traveled across interstellar distances and, or unless you, or as Tom DeLong told me on my podcast a long time ago, that those things have come from forwards in time or backwards I right. don't fully understand right and he can't prove it and he has no chain of evidence that traces the the alien spacecraft that that he claims he has evidence of um, he's lost the kind of provenance as they would call it mm. in antiquing um, so at what level do you say well okay that's now you're just talking about faith which is fine you could talk about faith all you want but your faith is almost like taste like I hate fish mm -hmm. there's no much you could take me to the seafood restaurant down the street and tell me how great this thing tastes and and I'm gonna say I I don't give a crap. I'm not going to eat that damn thing. <laughs> and you could say, even as people do, it doesn't taste like fish. I'll say, you know what else doesn't taste like fish? A freaking hamburger doesn't taste like fish. So I'll just skip the middleman and I'll have my own hamburger, right. right? So what's up, guys? I'm super psyched to introduce to you another product that I've been using for years now that was also recommended to me by the world-renowned nutritional scientist, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino. And it is called Keto Brains. Keto Brains Nootropic Creamer is a way to perfectly dial in your morning beverage to bring you razor sharp focus on demand. I start out every day with Keto Brains in my cup of coffee to combat the midday slump, and I use it for pre workout. Keto Brains Nootropic Creamer has efficacious doses of focus inducing alpha GPC, lion's mane, alpha wave promoting L theanine, and ketone stimulating C8 MCT powder. And all of those high functioning nootropics are packed into a delicious, creamy coconut powder. It tastes amazing. It's a keto nootropic powerhouse and it tickles all the right neurotransmitters to give you the flow and jitter free energy with absolutely zero crash. There's no dosage tricks involved. It's just one scoop is a full serving. You can put it in your coffee, your tea, put it in your water, whatever you want, and you get 30 full doses per package. There's no pills and there's absolutely no waiting for it to work. It kicks in like that. You can keep your brain razor sharp, primed and ready for action with Keto Brain's Nootropic Creamer. Whether you're an entrepreneur juggling multiple projects, a student studying for exams, or you're an athlete that's trying to optimize your training, Keto Brain's will not let you down. All right, here, I'm going to list all the ingredients contained in Keto Brains and what they do. It increases ketone production via AGC8 MCT powder. It increases acetylcholine and HGH production via 300 milligrams of alpha GPC. It increases GABA and alpha wave production via 250 milligrams of L-theanine. And it increases BDNF and NGF via 500 milligrams of lion's mane mushrooms. And these are all carefully sourced and third-party tested ingredients. This stuff quite literally increases acute brain function, protects your brain and mitochondria long-term, and last but not least, it makes your coffee delicious. If you're interested in Keto Brains and you wanna get a big discount, just go to the link in the description below ketobrains.com and use the promo code Danny20 when you check out. Again, that's ketobrains.com. Hit the link below and use the promo code Danny20 at checkout. Back to the show. There's no amount of that that will convince a person to believe based on your faith in something else, which may be very visceral to you. It may have saved your life or it may have you know, made you a better man, but that doesn't have any effect on other people. And science is about the the determination of rules and patterns throughout the universe that hold throughout the universe. The Copernican principle states the universe doesn't care who you are, where you are, what you are, what you're made of, what day it is. If I drop this this your gift, I'm going to wish you a happy Hanukkah. So oh, I brought you a gift. Thank you. So I, I got you. I got you two gifts. Well, three gifts. Um, so this is this is your gift for early Christmas present because I want you to keep your anus clean. Your anus. So so I got oh, you. Your wow, anus. this so is amazing. You got to share it with Steve. Oh, oh Steve, we can keep uh, our we can bleach our butthole. Your, your, your anus. You know that NASA is considering changing the name because it's so embarrassing to say your anus, right? <laughs> they've commissioned a panel. That's beautiful. They've come up with the following term: erectum. So, uh, and I'll tell you what this is later on. But if you um, if you look at something that is por uh, portending, you know, sort of masquerading as something that could be scientific, forces, fields, life in the universe, all these things are contingent upon the existence of life, which is a physics question, a biology question, evolution mm -hmm. question. And so they're saying, here's this thing that interacts with some people, but not others. Well, that violates the Copernican principle. Sorry, that's I'm going to have a big problem with you if you say that, like, there are only certain people that could experience it. So what good is it? You know, so in other words, the only the people that want to believe it will see it 
and only the people that that already do believe it will experience it. That's not science. It may be some cult or some new thing. And you see a lot of the same types of behavior. The people get very obsessed, almost cult-like, in their fervor for this. Mm. Jack is screaming out every no. Why won't you listen to me? Why won't you? And I think he's suffering a crisis of meaning, and that you know he wants to be accepted by as many people as possible. Well, how's that going to happen if you keep you know solipsistically referring back to yourself that you can only be the one that could be trusted with this? information and you're the only one that could see it and nobody no matter how much will ever get to experience your perception your taste your experience so right. i feel like it's at the highest level it becomes pointless almost to debate these people mm. so what in your view what do you think explains all these things like roswell and these things that these pilots are seeing on their radars and the sightings above these nuclear bases and, and all this stuff like what, what do you deduce from that I, from i don't want to avoid the question but but i'd say like what why don't you believe in muhammad like why aren't you a practicing muslim danny it's not fair right i mean like you might maybe you haven't seen evidence to believe like it's not up to you to explain why you're not a practicing muslim right mm -hmm. it's up to me if i was proselytizing as a muslim to try to convince you that actually muhammad the prophet was this and that and you should accept him or jesus or, or Mo, you know whatever right in other words you my lack of believing it is not a statement about me uh, unless you say like well what would it, what, what in other words how can i explain a billion muslims um worshiping um uh, muhammad allah and being pra like okay this is something that has convinced them so now you're asking me an analogous thing like what explains all these things well i don't believe that they're actually that they're representative of a reproducible scientific chain of events that can be tested using the scientific method if in fact it's true which i don't know but but if it's true that they only reveal themselves to certain people in certain places around nuclear plants you know then i have to be very suspicious as a scientist right i mean i'm a father so i have kids and i look at the kids and you know if they say like well i have an imaginary friend oh what's his name well you can't know you can't experience him so you know but he's telling me to like steal money from your wallet you know like okay well I, I would like to know more about that because you're telling me that something is happening mm -hmm. with something that I cannot have access to because either I don't have clearance or the government's conspiring to keep me from knowing that information, et cetera, et cetera. So what is the information that's out there? It's, it's, it's too hard for me to kind of assess the cred credibility of what's been claimed by various people. As I said, they're much more courageous. They're much braver, bigger balls than I'll ever have, right? Mm -hmm. That's Grush, whoever, Fravor. But that doesn't give them any extra ability to practice the scientific method than I have. And when you, I don't know, I mean, it would almost be better for me because you've, you've investigated these more. I'll say why I think it's unlikely. I'll never say that these, they don't exist. I won't even say that what they're claiming isn't correct. I'll just say that you have to ascribe a probability. And to me, the probability is very low. Uh, I can't say it's zero. I that they never. ever saw this stuff, this stuff ever happened? That that there are actually, I don't want to say that they saw it or they, that there are alien spacecraft from another solar system somewhere else in either our galaxy or another galaxy that has been collected by human beings on Earth. Right. I'm not saying that that's what it is. I'm saying like uh, Ryan or the people that Ryan knows or Fra Fravor, the things that they saw. What would you imagine them being based on your scientific perspective and, and your back? Like, you don't think that they're aliens from another galaxy. I don't think they are either. Yeah, okay. What, what do you think? What do you think the explanation for them is? Well, do, you, do you think that it's just a con construct? Well, so, uh, you know, the name of my podcast is called Into the Impossible. And, and the, 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 oftentimes people think it comes from the Sherlock Holmes quote, which is that, you know, once you've excluded anything, no matter how crazy the, the facts that remain, no matter how impossible they are, mm -hmm. uh, that is the actual truth. And, and for me, the Into the Impossible comes from a different quote from Arthur C. Clarke, that yep. the only way to determine the limits of the possible is to go beyond them into the impossible. Right. I have to ask, what types of phenomena are possible within the laws of physics that I am very, very conversant with and what things would go so so to speak outside the laws of physics you'd have to ascribe things to that so in other words how many improbable things does one have to believe to actually accept that these things are from another galaxy that's a separate question right? yes yes so what are they seeing so i will ask a, a different question i'll say what are plausible other explanations for what they've seen um so here's here's a statistic when uh the planet venus is visible on Earth about nine months out of the year. Three months out of the year, it's behind the sun, it's too close to the sun, it's mm -hmm. emerging from behind the sun, you can't see it. But nine months out of the year. 
um, in not only in uh, America, but throughout the world, the number of UFO sightings is statistically an incredibly amount more meaningful to be detected or to be claimed during the nine months of the year when Venus is visible. Mm. It's extremely bright. If you've ever seen it, it doesn't seem to move. It seems to hover uh, like the way the moon doesn't move when you're driving, the pa giant parallax of it. Same thing happens with Venus. Uh, it does change a little bit. It doesn't twinkle. It doesn't flash. And so millions of people, literally millions of people report it when it's um, when Venus is out. The number of UFO reports goes up dramatically in a statistically significant manner. Conversely, when it's not up, they go down, okay? So that's an explanation for some things that people are seeing, right? So if you said every single one of those people, unless they're all right, um, then th we can't believe in that being a UFO. Okay, so okay. you'd be right. You'd be right. That's Venus, so it's not a UFO. We have a very good identification, and it's not even flying. It's orbiting. Mm -hmm. um, so other things that, that make me curious about, suspicious about these claims. A lot of them are by military <laughs> uh, pilots. So mm -hmm. what do militaries do? Do they only have the best interest of their people at heart? Do they? Do the military ever use their own, and tragically and horribly, use their own conscripts or volunteers? Uh, do they only use them for beneficial purposes or for the actual missions that they signed up to do? Do they ever do psyops on them? Of course they do. Right? right. Do they ever abuse the power? The government ever abuse the power and abuse the people that are very bravest among us? Of course they do. Right. Um, do they ever subject them to things they would never subject an uh, ordinary citizen to under the Constitution? Yes, they're mm -hmm. exempt from certain things. They force them to get vaccines. They do all sorts of things. Right. Um, and so could it be? That there are uh, that they are maybe testing these pilots. Absolutely. Right. Um, furthermore, what are some other types of technology? Do you think all technology that the U.S. inventory has or adversary uh, governments have right now is known and is published in popular science? Hell no. Of course not. Right. So, uh, so therefore, there could be advanced technology that uh, that could have been basically kept com completely clandestine until it was interacted with by someone who thought they were a whistleblower, mm -hmm. right? So, um, uh, and then is it possible to maintain the conspiracy? It would have to be, I mean, David and others are alleging there's a conspiracy to cover up these things. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, can the conspiracy be maintained over eight decades um, not only between the thousands of individuals, you have to imagine. Ro let's say Roswell, even though I don't, I know it's not that. So don't don't flame me on the uh, on the on the channel comments below when you like, subscribe, and comment. I'll drop that for you. Thank uh, you. And don't uh, don't flame. Me. I don't believe this, but let's just say basically something like Roswell happened, where there was a crashed spacecraft in 1947, which by the way occurred very close to the Trinity site, very close to military secret compounds, and as are many of these things cited. You know, very few of them. Are Sided over Manhattan, you know, in the yes. middle of the of the uh, you know, Thanksgiving Day parade. It's, right. Um, many of them occur in warning areas, which are military traffic areas that even I, as a small pilot, am allowed to go into. So where the Tic Tac was seen was it was an area that's not restricted or prevented from uh, access to. It's something I go into at my risk. Mm -hmm. I can get shot down. They actually use my plane as target practice. They don't actually shoot. <laughs> Thank God I won't be here. But they'll, they'll, you know, there's a little Cessna and they'll practice locking on. Thank God they do. I want them to train. I want them to be the best freaking fighting force in the world. I love this country. I want them to be, and I want them to be protected. I want them to be safe. I don't want them to be experimented on. I don't have control over that. Right. Uh, but could they be being spoofed? Could this thing have been a drone? Now they'll say, well, it moved so fast. It can't be. Are there ways to, to spoof both um, both optical sensors like the human eye, cameras in 2004? Well, I t gave this example when I was on Joe Rogan's show. I'll give it now because I don't expect everybody listens to all my stuff, although I wish that they did. Um, I said 1943, there was a great physicist. He's actually featured in the movie Oppenheimer. His name is Louis Alvarez. Yeah. And Louis Alvarez uh, was just a genius. He and his son actually came up with the theory uh, of how the dinosaurs were exterminated through this impact of a meteorite and collected the evidence for what's called the TK boundary, um, the Chicxulub event in, in the Yucatan. Uh, mm -hmm. And so he was just a polymath. He knew everything. But he was also a nuclear physicist. But he, in part... In addition to the Manhattan Project, there was another secret project led out of MIT, and it was to develop radar in partnership with the British, mm. and it was to develop the first uh, radar um, sensing technology, 19, early 1940s. And it was almost as important, if not, it was probably more important than the Manhattan Project. In other words, it saved more allied lives, perhaps, and or, you know, it, it, it established protection. It allowed London to be basically saved during the war from complete, you know, just utter annihilation. Right. 
So Alvar is working on it, and and in that time, uh, there were no. It was just radar would be used. It would it would send up a pulse, and that pulse would bounce off an aircraft, come back down, and it would get reduced a little bit by each time it made a made transmitted something called the inverse square law. So the signal amplitude or the intensity decreases. The flux that you detect decreases as one over the distance to the object squared. So if I bounce a sonar or radar off of you, the intensity will decrease by one over the distance between us, say a meter away squared. Mm -hmm. And then if I moved you twice as far away, it'd be four times lower, okay? And um, and then it will also get another factor because now you become another transmitter at the distance, the same distance. So it goes down as one over R to the fourth power. Okay, so it's a very, very steep function. Yep. What Alvarez said, and the, and the Germans knew that. So the planes coming towards them and um, and they would uh, the Allied planes were coming towards the Germans. The Germans would say, oh, the signal's getting bigger as one over the distance to the fourth power. And then they could target it very accurately and send rocket or shoot it down or send out other planes to shoot it down. What Alvarez said is, let me do the following. As my plane is flying towards you, I'm going to transmit a signal to you. Okay, which sounds weird. Why would I transmit a signal telling you where I am? No, no, no. But he transmitted it at the exact rate of decrease that I would expect as if the plane were going away. So he started off with some signal at, say, one unit, and then he dropped it by uh, the fourth power, and they were like, oh, the plane's going away. It's no longer a threat. Right. Boom. Then they blew up the site with an anti, uh, what's mm -hmm. called anti-radiation bomb. Right. So if you were a German, you know, one of the most advanced technological, you know, uh, civilizations on Earth, you would be saying that object defied the laws of physics. Mm -hmm. Not only do we not see it, but we also so it had some stealth capabilities too. But it actually, it moved faster than the speed of light, and it moved in a way that we can't understand. It was here one minute, but actually we thought it was there, but it was actually you know eighty kilometers away, right. and that happened in one second. That's you know get or you know, mm -hmm. million microseconds. So it appeared to defy the laws of physics. So there are all sorts of things that they could do, especially during military. Military are the least reliable in a certain sense because they're probably the ones that are most confronted with both the adversary's highest technology and our own, their own friendly militaries, you know, psyops and, and experiments on them and yeah. loyalty tests and all sorts of um, false flag events or colored wars, and all sorts of things that they can do to sort of spoof and to train and to test the, 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 the fighting force's readiness and their loyalty. And it's just, that's just a fact of life. So, and you have to, add, is that more plausible, Danny? The, and I'm not saying I'm right. And again, I'm never saying this, that, that I have a final word either. Do your own you know, due diligence. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not investment advice. But if you look at the data, mm -hmm. then you compare it to the alternative hypothesis it's called the likelihood ratio test. This is mm -hmm. what scientists do. You say like, how likely is it that this vaccine is going to improve your life and mm -hmm. prevent some disease versus it's going to kill you? And, you know, for most vaccines, it's very important to know that likelihood yeah. ratio. But you're always comparing the null hypothesis, okay? The null hypothesis is this is not going to do any harm or any benefit. Or in this case, there is there are no aliens is my null hypothesis. Okay. Then take this ratio, and we could do a mathematical function that will predict what are the different levels. In other words, should it be... 99% uh, confident? Should it be 50% uh, confident, which is almost useless? Or should it be 99.99% confidence in hypothesis? It's called hypothesis testing. And then you have to question, what if there are aliens and you assume that they're not? So you get a false negative? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if Brian Keating is right, then it's, um, like, I'm responsible for a huge false negative. Or if you say there's a false positive, you are claiming they're aliens when there aren't aliens. Those are both errors, right? In both cases, you're wrong. You'd like it to be there are aliens. If there are aliens, you detect that there are aliens. Or if there are no aliens, you rule out the existence of aliens. Those are the kind of correct answers. And then there's okay. two different ways you can be wrong, false positive, false negative. Right. Which is worse? Like, you go to the doctor. The doctor says to you, Danny, you got cancer. Which would you rather have there be? He's false positive or false negative? <laughs> right. False right. Positive. So it's it's right. If, if the good role, but normally what happens is you get you might get a false negative, right? I mean that's much more common because it's hard to see small amounts of cancer, for example. Right. It's also hard to see small amounts of UFOs, right? And these things have been able to travel across interstellar distances, right? And the old joke Elon Musk keeps making, like, why is the you know photo quality so bad? Why is the you know video you know why is it so crappy? The cell phones have gotten so much better. I think I have some explanations for that, by the way. Or here's my other favorite one. And uh, again, I'm steel manning my opponents, not my enemies, right. just my intellectual <laughs> opponents. I don't, I don't believe, I don't not want to believe it. By the way, let me put a pin in in the in the explanation for for why these things keep happening where they do. But um, I I and 
and good physicists like Eric or and others, um, even people that aren't physicists that are skeptical, they, um, Avi Loeb is a good example. He's a skeptic. He doesn't believe, and he's got vested interest in you know millions and perhaps billions of dollars in 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 the you know Galileo project and all the other right, things right. he's doing. He'd be great for you to talk to. I talked to him. He's down here. Okay, great. So my question is, um, who? would be more overjoyed at the existence of some, I mean, whatever, if, if again, assume they're aliens mm -hmm. for the time being, have they uh, led to the, you know, Independence Day, like destruction of the earth? No, right? We're still here. Yes. You know, maybe they're planning something, but like so far they've been benevolent or benign. Right. right. They haven't bothered us, right? Mm -hmm. Who would be more overjoyed with a race, a species, a civilization of technologically advanced aliens? Who would be more thrilled than physicists? We would be, I mean, you see how we get with like ChatGPT, which is like nothing compared to the kind of intelligence it would take to make an alien spacecraft that can traverse the galaxy and, and bend space and time, right? In other words, physicists have a vested interest in aliens existing. In other words, I will say, I want to believe, I want there to be aliens to tell us about the physics of the 29th century. I don't want to wait that long. I want to know, I'm going to live for another 50 years maybe. I want to learn as much as possible while I'm still alive. Aliens can help be the ultimate cliff notes to help me understand it. And so I have a vested interest in there being aliens, okay? But I, I as I say, I'm skeptical about it, okay? Now I mentioned, there's this, there's this you know, kind of joke, again, in Elonism, gotta love Elon, but he's like, oh, these these aliens are so advanced. They navigated from the closest star system, Proxima Centauri uh, B, at traveling at you know a quarter of the speed of light would take 25 years and do untold damage you know to whatever biologics are in there and it would uh, require you know basically the warping of space time to accelerate to these speeds. Anything macroscopic like the size of a spacecraft, like a Tic Tac, almost an infinite supply of energy, mm -hmm. propulsion, Safari warp drives, whatever you want. Okay. Yeah. But they crash in the island of Catalina off the coast of Los Angeles. They, they like crash somewhere in Roswell. In other words, they're so skilled that they traverse the entire galaxy, but they, uh, they can't. No, not real, because yeah, they crash I, all the time. I don't think that's what a lot of people believe. A lot of people believe that they're for, for, from here, that mm. they're living under the oceans, and they're coming from here. They're coming I under the heard. oceans, and they're... they're that's I mean that's what Sarfati believes. That's what a lot of people I've oh. talked to on here believe. They, they're they're not coming from other galaxies. They're actually here. So like Atlantis. Uh, in, in, no, well, yeah, maybe 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 Atlantis. I don't know, but they think that these things are coming from the oceans, and these things maybe live under the oceans, or they're walking among among us, or maybe there are people that are out there like me and you, or Elon Musk, more likely, that are genetically also like this alien race, right? They're they're they look and talk like me and you, but they aren't. It, you know, they're they don't look like the aliens we see in the movies, but they're technically aliens. Okay. And or or this that. technology that's coming around, that's that's flying around that they're seeing is not necessarily it's not coming from another star system. It's coming from here somewhere, and it's remaining hidden. Um, well, so I, I'm talking more about the uh, the types of alien, like the Roswell. Roswell, to my knowledge, was so not right. from the ocean. It was from another star, you know, Recula, Reticulum, whatever, Omega. So. Um, uh, but but I just want to make a statement about that. When if you do hear that again, I'm supporting the um, the the fact pattern that should be amenable to many members of your audience, and mm -hmm. not to ingratiate myself. Mm -hmm. But because it's a legitimate as a scientist, you should actually specify all the ways you could be wrong. Right. I'm telling you all the ways Brian Keaton could be wrong. So mm -hmm. in this case, though, those that say that it's impossible to believe that these advanced civilizations crashed, you know, after navigating their whole way across the entire galaxy, right? No, actually, it's a, a very common effect. Something like six times. So I don't want to say this, jinx myself. I'm getting on a plane in what, an hour or so, an hour and a half. Um, so something like six times, you're six times more likely to be involved in a plane that crashes upon landing than you are at any other phase in flight. Right. Even though the fraction of that plane being in landing is only a few minutes or right. a few seconds. Landing and takeoff, right? Both. Um, yeah. Takeoff is also dangerous, but mm -hmm. but landing in particular seems, and it's the whole landing process, not just like touching down the right. runway. Right. And these aren't fatal crashes. I mean, 90% of crashes people walk away from. Mm -hmm. Most commercial airlines and 
please God, it should hold true at least through tonight when I get home. Unless you're on that Malaysian <laughs> flight with the UFOs that are floating. Oh yeah, you were uh, you had been talking about that, right? <laughs> so, yeah, well, um, Julian got caught up in a bunch of drama. Over I have not, not investigated. Just don't even look at it. Don't waste your time. So you know, when that was happening, it was right when my the experiment described in my first book, Losing the Nobel Prize, was we were made the announcement on the front page of the New York Times that we discovered the origin of the universe as evidenced by these waves of gravity. Uh, and so, yeah, that was right when Putin invaded Crimea the first time oh. and when the Malaysian airline, that's tragically crashed. So we shared the New York Times top billing with those events. Anyway, um, so it's it's not at all un, un, unexpected that if these spacecraft were traveling that they would crash in the final mm -hmm. segment. And to give the people like Elon to say, oh, well, you know, why is the video camera so cr crappy? And why is it that this, again, another thing, it's called the zoo hypothesis. Mm -hmm. These are just ways that you could evade the Fermi paradox. And so basically, it's a Fermi paradox is a interesting scientific. He was a physicist, a theoretical and experimental physicist, last of a breed. He was at uh, Los Alamos too, wasn't he? Yeah, he was a huge, uh, he was one of the, oh, he invented the first th controlled chain reaction at the University of Chicago. At Fermilab is named after him, and you know, people have claimed weird things in Fermilab. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but the Fermi paradox is, you know, if the universe is so big, it should be teeming with aliens. How come we haven't seen any? Of course, a lot of people believe we have seen them and just it's being covered up. But the question as to why, you know, the, the either the, the video quality is so bad or why they would choose to come here. Um, you know, when you when you think about, uh, you know, what what is interesting about Earth? Is Earth interesting? Is that worth them coming to take a look at? A lot of people say no. And a lot of people, though, you look at how amazing life is on Earth and how amazing human beings are. To me, it's, it's a it would be a natural place for them to come and yeah. visit. And so, yeah, when you, when you think about, well, what interests them and why would they allow themselves to be seen? So there's something called the zoo hypothesis I mentioned a second ago. The zoo hypothesis is that they're here. But just like when you go to the zoo, you don't like go and knock on the window of the gorillas and keep bothering them. Or Jane Goodall, the primatologist. Mm -hmm. so she, when she would go to the Serengeti, she wouldn't go, hi, everybody, you know, hey, you know, taking all these flash paparazzi type camera pictures, right? She wouldn't do that. In this case, um, when you, when the, let's say the aliens did come again, don't believe this personally, or I don't have evidence for this, but if it were true that they left when they first discovered that human beings were you know, alive and, and could produce things, the very first technological signature we blasted out into space was like the 1936 Olympic Games, something like that. And it was first widely televised, not over cable TV, but over the air, so it was free to propagate. Now they wouldn't see anything, or they would see very little because most stuff goes under the ocean. So it was broadcasting through sat uh, satellite into outer space. So 70, 80 years ago, they could have known about it. So what's 70, 80 years ago, what kind of technology do they think that we had? So let's say they start off, oh, human beings over there, planet three Sol, you know, it's in the solar system, uh, you know, it's, it's green, blue planet. Let's go there. They set off 80 years ago. They're looking at the technology that we had then. <clears throat> right, so they wouldn't say, "Oh, we should make sure we cloak ourselves <laughs> and and are stealthy uh, because they have iPhone 15s." They don't know about that. In other words, they left. They're, they're not, you know, they're the technology that then maybe as they travel, they could have learned about our technology as it keeps increasing, but mm -hmm. not only at the rate at which we were broadcasting into the, you know, they just learned about iPhone uh, 15 when you and I did, right, like three months ago. <laughs> right. So, in other words, it shouldn't. It's not surprising. So, a lot of these things are. I think, um, uh, you know, basically pandering to like, oh, well, they're not there. Here's You can just dismiss it because the video quality is crappy. They wouldn't crash land if they're such expert pilots, and, um, and they wouldn't allow themselves to be seen. Those are completely illegitimate arguments against it, uh, supporting a position I believe in, which are faith in or right, have right. evidence for, which is that they don't exist. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important as a scientist to do that, and I think – the more you talk to experimentalists, the better. People are actually building stuff, you know, grappling with law. If you brought Edward Witten in here, you know, he, he, I don't know if he could, you know, turn on the, the Wi-Fi and get the Wi-Fi up to boot again. You know, the theoretical physicists are very different than experimental physicists. They have a different skill set. It's much more like a mathematician. I don't think anyone would say, let's get the mathematicians in here. Although, you know, people like Stephen Wolfram have done things with like alien, like deciphering alien language in the movie Arrival. He was a consultant on that. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, Kip Thorne uh, is actually right. did a lot of work in the movie Interstellar. So, yeah, these are these are things that are of interest, but yep. uh, I almost am betting against my own mm -hmm. self-interest. When you talked to Ryan, did he mention to you the thing with the cube and the sphere? Yeah. I mean, he, he had said that that's what his... 
uh, his fellow pilots had had claimed that they had seen, and we're seeing on an almost continuous basis. Yeah. So, I, I, from what I understood was when they saw the cube in the sphere, they were flying, and then all of a sudden, like they just passed this thing, and then he said it was like right off of their like the left or the right hand of the plane, like off the wingspan. And it necessarily, they didn't necessarily see it. That's move. not what I heard. Oh, really? What did you hear? Well, I asked him that specifically as a pilot. I was like, how close were these things? And he said they flew between us, and he said that multiple times. And I said, you have to be more clear. How close were you? Because my best friend, one of my best friends, Ari Kleinerman, who's a Princeton physics graduate and a, a commander in the Navy. He actually is higher ranked than Ryan. Mm -hmm. They're buddies. He went to his wedding. Um, and so Ryan was right there. And I said, when you guys are flying in these formations, how close are you guys? And he said, over a mile apart, typically a mile apart. Really? So two planes separated by a mile. That means the closest you know, that they could have been to this thing is half a mile. And they might have perfect vision, but the cube they describe is about a meter across something like that, and the sphere surrounding it. I, I always get it mixed up, but I believe that's what it was, about a meter or so. Mm -hmm. um, so to the visual acuity to see something, imagine you got half a mile, like 10 football fields or more, and you're looking at the football. How Could you tell the football was one you know, foot big, or could you tell it was three feet big? Yeah, it could yeah. be, if it wasn't glowing or doing shot. something, it's very difficult mm -hmm. to do. And again, no aspersions on Ryan. I think what he's doing is very important. Mm -hmm. And in... And I also think that, you know, he is not claiming he saw it. And it's just like Grush. Grush is not claiming he saw mm -hmm. these things. He's saying he has knowledge of people that have seen it. And in the case of Grush, I don't know what his motivations might be. I'd love to talk to him. He seems like a great, you know, again, courageous, valorous, uh, patriotic, whatever. But he's not claiming these things. Ryan has a motive. He actually has a motive. And it happens to be a beneficent one, a good one, in that he's concerned about the safety of his fellow pilots. Which actually made me a little bit suspicious. Not of him. I mean, I love him. He's I've been to my house for dinner. I, I, I really enjoy Ryan. But he described, and we talked about. Did you find it? it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, you want it? Yeah, yeah. Throw it up. Yeah. Okay. Continue. Sorry. Okay. So Ryan um, uh, didn't have this particular fact happen to him, but Fravor did. I don't know if you remember the interview when he did with Lex Friedman and and others, but um, he said, you know, he saw this tic tac. And then almost by the time he landed back on the aircraft carrier, his fellow pilots were just hazing him mercilessly. And he was like outranking them. So I could understand like a little bit of teasing or whatever, but they basically didn't believe him. Mm -hmm. And now Ryan's saying this is happening all the time off the coast of Virginia. By the way, they're both in warring areas, both in the same type of aircraft. Mm -hmm. One Ryan's aircraft and the ones that have been um, seeing this had just been upgraded to a new type of camera. Right. Um, again, they use these cameras to lock on to see, you know, they'll do everything from a, my friend uh, Ariel, I don't think it's classified, I think he talked about, he shot down an Iranian drone over the Persian Gulf during the Iraq War. Um, you know, they, they see these things all the time and it was right after they upgraded the systems. Right. Why do they upgrade them? They have to calibrate them and they have to get better and better systems. Fravor's one was 20 years old now, by, by now about 20 years old and 10 years older than the one that Ryan Graves had, had been using or his, his uh, squadron. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why would they be you know, kind of hazing somebody. If, if, if indeed it was causing this grave threat and something's happening all the time, um, you know, why is it happening in these warning areas? You know, why is it happening in places where they do training? It's, it's not happening. Why aren't there by, by ratio of, you know, proportion, you know, tens of thousands of commercial pilots, private pilots like me, you know, seeing it, reporting it. I could see if you're a commercial pilot and you report this. If you get hazed in the Navy, they're not going to kick you out. They're just going to put like a, a fuzzy alien on your bunk. Um, if you're if you're in the if you're in flying for American Airlines and you keep reporting this, you probably would get either put on you know psychiatric leave or something mm -hmm. like that. So there's a big uh, imperative to keep quiet, probably for those people. But people <clears throat> like me. You know, just private pilots flying, you know, sometimes I fly cancer patients to get treatments and it's called Angel Flight, which is a great charity people should be aware of. Um, there's no incentive for me not to, to, to report this. There's no reporting platform that is as good as the one that Ryan's going to make with, with the Safe Air, Air Americans for Safe Aerospace. So there's a motive. It's a good one for him to do it. I think there's, you have to ask, well, why aren't there more sightings by people that have no skin in the game? That's a question I have. Mm. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Seed. Have you ever been in a situation where you had a gut feeling and it paid off? There's a reason you trust your gut. And that's why our entric nervous system, which regulates the gut, is often called the body's second brain. Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic is a new standard in probiotic, which supports digestive, skin, heart, and gut health. 
Its non-fermenting formula is supported by clinical trials and scientific studies and delivers what you need, where you need it. I personally use seed because it helps support my body's ability to break down fats and lipids. And it maintains my blood cholesterol levels already in the healthy range. And with Seed's DSO-1 Symbiotic, it's two capsules in one. The outer layer dissolves in your stomach with fiber that feeds your gut bacteria. And the inner capsule is designed to travel all the way to the colon for the precision-delivered payload. Additionally, Seed is rigorously tested for 14 classes of allergens defined by the European Food Safety Authority. Listen to your gut with Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic. Go to seed.com forward slash Danny and use the code 25Danny to get 25% off your first month. That's 25% off your first month of Seed's Daily DSO-1 Symbiotic at seed.com forward slash Danny, code 25Danny. Back to the show. So this is an interesting article. Yeah. Um, my friend Jeremy Reese pointed this out to me. Scroll down. Yeah, I've, I've talked to Jeremy before. Okay, yeah. so this is a patent. Mm -hmm. And this is a radar deflector mm -hmm. that was used during the, I think it was developed during like the Bay of Pigs to spoof radar. Yeah, it's like the US patent 2 million. That's yeah, so like, can you I'm, zoom I'm in on the text? 9 million, so this is probably 60 or 50. Can you zoom in, punch in a little bit on so we can read it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, scroll up. Yeah, airborne cargo reflector. Yeah, cargo yeah, right reflectors there. reflectors on your bicycle. Yep, high bicycle. altitude balloons, doesn't have, if any, the radar cross-section metallic, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it tells you the, like, the exact patent number. Yeah. And that thing looks exactly like yeah. what they described. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. The, the cube inside the sphere. And and here's here's another thing I can say with great uh, with great accuracy. I guarantee that these exist. You know, in other right. words, if you knew if you lived in a world where these didn't exist, say you get a letter from God, these things don't these balloons don't exist for benign purposes for calibration and sensor testing. If you said that they're they're forbidden by every treaty on every country on earth, like uh, anthrax is, okay, mm -hmm. then you'd say, well, there's less probability, but there's probably still some left over. But now I tell you, tell me, which I thank you for. These are common. These are probably in use by every military on earth to train their stuff. I saw this video of like Ukrainian drone um, pilots that are dropping like tank shells and they have, they're so poor, their military is saying, you know, I'm not going to take signs or whatever, but they still, they have, they have radar jamming and they have an, um, anti-drone channel jamming technology that spoofs, makes a fake drone appear. Right, on the right, exactly. They have this with like no money. Mm -hmm. And so I guarantee, so we are both in agreement. It makes it look like a fleet is coming at you yeah, when there's nothing exactly. coming at you. There's nothing comes, so you waste all your attention, mm -hmm. right? These warheads have multiple targets in them. Right, and so if you were to thing, test this on in, in front of US military training yeah. site, you want, and they just upgraded their radar, Where why would you, wouldn't exactly. you want to be trying to Where test it? Where would you have this? That's a very good point. Yep. Appreciate that. That's so right. that's, I mean, that's sort of my belief as to what this thing is. I think it's some tech, I mean, and I, you know, I've read this book by Annie Jacobson called The Pentagon's Brain. It's all about the history of DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research. Oh, wow. No, I haven't. And uh, I mean, they have been testing things like Neuralink since the early 90s. Oh, wow. On like soldiers. That like I putting yep. Like putting shit in their in their yeah, heads that makes I them told you, they do immune to pain things. and yeah. all kinds of crazy stuff. They want to like, make a super soldier. They're they're yeah, making a super soldier. And they're they're pushing the limits like they're going into the impossible literally yeah. like 30 years before that's in America, the public Danny, hears about this kind of stuff. That's it. Think about what these other countries that have zero like you think Vladimir Putin really isn't going to try like much more advanced shit that we would never do right. even with as despicably as we treated my stepfather was in the Vietnam War and he's told me incredible stories in combat and outside of combat. They did horrible things to our soldiers and, and our soldiers are like uh, you know some of our bravest people two of my best friends are Afghan they're both like permanently disabled Marines uh, Army Infantry and they were done for like just both bullshit reasons they shouldn't have been in these wars right and um and so they took the best of america and they do fucking experiments on them mm -hmm. they do this to this day right but again does that prove there <laughs> does that prove that there aren't aliens no of course not you just have to be skeptical yeah. and again always look at the story there are people that uh, you know people say oh michael Shermer, he doesn't want to believe in alien you know he's got like like what is the incentive for him not to believe in it he is you know for people that that dislike him and he's a friend of mine i've written articles with him i've debated him you know and, and we have a friendly debate so the point is you have to ask like qui bono who benefits why would you do why would you take this position what is he covering up or avi loeb i've seen oh he's covering up for the avi loeb has an incentive to for alien and not only for his book deals and you know becoming number one bestseller again you know but but also just for his scientific you know curiosity this is a guy who's like dedicated his life now and his career and his and his reputation towards like not only you know seeing the existence of other aliens as a plausible proposition but 
that maybe, as he claimed on my podcast this week, that alien, you know, something from another alien civilization, potentially, with, with materials that indicate it's come from outside of our solar system, crashed in Papua New Guinea. And right. we can go and retrieve it and see if it's actually from metallurgical processes, not natural cosmic ray spallation processes. Right. Now, it, like getting back to this whole thing, when, and when I start to see the New York Times and the Pentagon start to corroborate these stories in lockstep, that's yeah. when I really start to question it. And when, and like when it comes to these videos, like the, the, that they released, right? The, the go fast, the gimbal, and what, I forget what the other one was. Who the fu I was talking to Ryan. Who named those videos? Who came up with that name? Go fast. Who came up with that name? Gimbal. Because those those pilots. I know the pilots did not. Yeah. So one one of the uh, so there's a there's a set. And again, talk to Ryan. Talk to my friend Ariel. But um, there's a set of military. So after a flight, every plane that flies for one hour has a scrutiny around it of about 10 hours just for the debrief. So when they come back, they land on the carrier or they land at the Air Force, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and they, they, they debrief the flight every single minute because every minute costs about $8,000 in total investment for right. every single plane. Imagine how much money we have, right? right? And then there's 10 hours of maintenance for every single plane that goes, all right, so that's separate from that. Mm -hmm. They review all the gun cameras. They review all the sensor data. They review everything. People pour over. And there's some analysts, you know, who, you know, be in the past, you know, before we had drone operators, there were people that were officers that would be intelligence officers and they would review stuff and then like when they would review it they'd listen to something and they'd just name it so a gimbal is just a camera on a right. platform like a GoPro or, exactly. or not a GoPro but you know one of those stabilized things yeah. um, and uh, and, the, and the other one go fast I think one of the pilots says well look at that thing it's fast or whatever and then they just call it that mm -hmm. um then there are other ones that have been, you know, fairly like the Boca and those ones. I mean, this guy, Mick the West. The triangles. Yeah, the triangles. Yeah, the Boca, yeah. A lot of those things are artifacts of cameras. Yes. So the question is, you know, can you explain all of these things? And my colleague and, and actually mentor and, and president of the Simons Foundation, David Spurgle, was the chairman of the NASA committee on UAP uh, research that announced its findings this, this past summer. And I think that they said some some very large fraction was explainable by natural events, but there's always going to be that, you know, 12 to 30 percent that's not explainable. And the question is, what at what level do you start to ascribe conspiracy, cover-ups mm -hmm. versus the honest admission of a scientist, the three most important words that any scientist must be able to say. And if they can't, they're not a scientist. And that's, I don't know. And that's, again, getting back to our friend Jack, he'll never say that. Never right. said it. I was wrong. I don't know. Right. It's always I know, and you idiots aren't listening to me, and you're a schmuck. Yep. And so good luck. You know, you're not going to really get too many takers there. Yeah. And you know, if the government's been lying to us about this or covering it up for eighty years, what makes you think that they're going to all of a sudden come out and want to tell the truth? Yeah. Or that they that the cover up that lasted for eighty years of durability once it uh, once it does crack, what there's not a flood like uh, that everything doesn't come out. I mean, right. the question of that like they're not controlling it. Yeah, that they they have such power to control for generations, like multiple generations. And by the way, it's not just like. You know, the guy who saw the spacecraft crash in Roswell. Okay, what do they do? Just just think realistically. What would you have to do? Just, again, Roswell's my paradigm. I'm not saying I believe anything uh, is legitimate about it being bodies and spacecraft and whatever. You know, it could have some. It could, it could not, right? But some guy, some general knew about it. Okay. Someone discovers, some farmer discovers it. Um, then the, they call the military base nearby. Then they send out a truck. Then there's four guys on the truck. Then they drop the truck, uh, has a crane operator on the back. Then they drop that. They pick it up. They drive it to the, to the warehouse. Then they mm -hmm. store it in the warehouse and somebody has to guard the warehouse. The warehouse has to be climate controlled. Then it has to be, the, and, then it take, and then you have to do all this paperwork. Mm -hmm. And then take all those people that I've already named 10 of them, take all those people. They have 10 people in their lives, kids, brothers, sisters, wives, husbands, whatever, hundred people just in generation zero. The first time that these people discover, right? Mm -hmm. 1947, correct. Um, and, uh, and then they have kids. And then those 10 generation, those 10 people have kids, a hundred people have kids, you know, it becomes enormous. And to say that all those people have not, you know, spilled the beans, if you like, on the biggest story in humankind's yeah. history, right? Yeah. This is so much bigger than even the tragic assassination of, of JFK. I mean, that affected one person, uh, obviously, tragically, a huge country was affected by it, but it was one person, and that's so it's relatively easier to cover. That Even that hasn't been effectively covered up for very long, right. with government mandating that you can't open up the official records for 50 years. Right. So, yeah, it's uh, it, it stretches the mind. Doesn't mean it's not true.
what is it that Eric was harping on so hard on? I, I don't know if it was on Rogan's podcast or if it was with that guy, Jesse Michaels, but he was talking to Hal Putoff, the ex-Scientologist yeah. guy, uh, also the remote podcast. viewer guy from yeah. SRI. Mm -hmm. And they were talking to him. He was basically explaining how in the 50s, I think it was Ed Witten's dad. Yeah. They were like making a lot of progress on anti-gravity. And then all of a sudden, it went. the research went dark, like it stopped out of yeah. nowhere. Well, so is he is he, was he alluding to like the government took it over or like it went dark meaning like it went dark under like a special access program or something? Well, yeah. So it's it's not really clear. Eric has you know has an incredible ability to kind of explain things to to be curious to to illustrate things with with amazing analogies yeah. and with a with a commanding knowledge of history. Um, and a commanding knowledge of mathematics and physics. So Jack said, oh, he's just a mathematician. That's bullshit. Uh, he's much, much more than that. Mm -hmm. um, he's creative. He's generative. But uh, what he's not good at doing is like writing stuff up in a freaking book. <laughs> you know? So I'm like, Eric, you've got seven books in you. You know, help me help you write a book. You know, put these ideas into place because you can't just like every time you go on my podcast or on Jesse's or whatever – you know, have these statements or Rogan's, there's no durability to that. And I actually told this to Rogan about motivating him to write a book because mm -hmm. no one's going to go back and listen. I was episode 2023. It was a cool number, you know, easy to remember. I don't know what the hell episode, you know, the first time Eric was on, no one's going to go back and watch Eric the first time he was on episode 1432. You know? Yeah. So but if he wrote a book about it, and wrote, you know, summarized the coolest topics in aliens and, and like you know, psychedelics. Joe always, no matter what, you're going to talk about psychedelics when you talk with Joe. Uh, but just like distill each one into a chapter. He doesn't even have to write it. Billions of people would write it for him for free. Anyway, mm -hmm. Eric has to do the same thing. I'm trying to get him to do it. We'll see if that will actually work. But what he was saying about this uh, this gravity program, there was a there in North Carolina, um, uh, UNC, I believe it was, and um, uh, research triangle area. They, uh, Ed Witten's father, who wasn't really, he was a f uh, physicist of some renown, but not as great a renown as his son, who's a mathemat mathematical physicist, Ed Edward. Um, but they had uh, working on what's called the Gravity Prize, and they had money and incentives, and there was some papers apparently written about anti gravity. And uh, I was joking, yeah, I tried to find those papers. They're so good, I couldn't put those anti gravity papers down. Is there anti gravity, Danny? Come on, I can't put it down. I got it. <laughs> Come on, I got to bring the dad, dad jokes, brother. <laughs> you don't let me eat one dad joke in this, on this beloved podcast. I'm doing uh, the best thing I've ever heard is uh, the term Jew Nersey. I really appreciate you saying that <laughs> yeah. on Julian's podcast. Julian's, that's right. I, I won't gotta, let that go. Got to give him some, some twerk. <laughs> um, so, yeah, allegedly, according to Eric, yeah, they had this, and now Eric has found some material. You know, that he claims is like an Australian patent. And this is stuff that Grush had mentioned on Joe Rogan's podcast. Mm -hmm. And it, it does relate. And I think they did bring this up. Um, but again, as I asked you earlier, and you, I think you answered properly in, in a certain sense, like, is the technology that's needed to do these things, you're, you're really prejudiced if you say that, you know, that it's necessary to have new laws of physics that we don't understand. This is Eric's claim, actually. He actually believes that the only way to get off of the Earth's surface and make it to... Uh, and to instantiate a second cosmic home is not with a chemical rocket of SpaceX. Right. It's to change the laws of physics. Is um, that changing the laws of physics, though, with some of the ideas of, of, of having some sort of, like Bob Lazar explained with his basketball reactor that was powered with element 115, I think it was. And he says basically, like, he tried to touch it and it, like, repelled his hand off like, a anti, like a magnet. Like, and if you had something like that, and he showed, like, the diagrams of it of how basically... It creates this field around the aircraft to where it's when it's moving like this, it's falling through space. Like it's almost like if you drop something, it's moving that way. All right. And these are just his ideas or something he claims he's seen made or it could be in person. Because, I mean, he's not a great physicist. He's not. not I mean, he's not, not a physicist I don't even think he is a physicist. No, he right. claims he was like a pilot. But then there are all these questions. That he, was he really attended? Did he have all the credentials that he claims that he had? And Did he see the things or have access to things that he but had? But like, even people like Jeremy. Jeremy's an amateur physicist, too. I mean, he has a bachelor's degree in physics. Yeah. And he's like studying all this stuff. And he says that it's not doesn't defy the laws of physics. It's just creating. You, you need the amount. You need. A, a high, high, high amount of energy to, to do it. And it said it's impossible well, to... Right. Either a high amount, large amount of energy or a minuscule amount of energy in an infinite amount of space. So we do know about anti-gravity. It's called dark energy or cosmological constant. It seems to be the force that's causing galaxies to accelerate at greater and greater velocities with every passing day. Something that won the Nobel Prize for two, three of my friends uh, in the year 2011. I've had them all on my podcast. 
and um, it's, a, it's well known a phenomenon as exists. But the 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 problem is that at energy level differs from the so-called zero point energy level by something like 120 orders of magnitude. And the kind of characteristic energy scale that we see that put, that we know about that pushes galaxies apart, perhaps inflated the universe at early times. Those things related to so-called zero point fluctuations, Casimir effects, uh, Cubieri warp drives, and mm-hmm. they're infinite, almost like you say, infinite, almost near infinite amount of energy. Right. So it's not only manipulate we have no way to like say use the energy of the acceleration of space time we don't we can't do that there's no there's no way to couple into it um and we actually know extremely little about it so the, the question i always have is okay so now you've got this theory of this anti which no one has demonstrated except for the cosmos at large which is you know again resulted in at least th- three nobel prizes so far um that nobody else knows about this that like what would be the incentive to not expose this to to get credit to win a Nobel Prize to make millions and billions of dollars why would this not be more why is Bob Lazar is like not a scientist not military trained you know I mean what what is the incentive to believe that such a person other than you want to believe it it sounds right. really plausible yes. it sounds cool it could explain things that you that you have no access to and so tying together like a whole bunch of things that are each incredibly improbable. The U.S. government has a conspiracy. The, uh, these craft have traveled great distances. There are new laws of physics that they operate by. Um, doesn't make them more credible. It makes it much, much less credible. If you add, if you multiply probabilities, which is how they they add together, if you like, you multiply. Like you have a ten percent chance of it raining. My flight's ten percent chance of leaving on time. If the rain is, you know, here, mm-hmm. and then there's a one percent chance that the Uber driver will be on time to get me here, mm-hmm. which hopefully will be coming soon. Uh, <laughs> not that I don't enjoy talking to you. It's just I enjoy putting my kids to bed. Jesus uh, Christ, it's already two thirty. <laughs> well, time flies. You're having fun. But putting these things together makes it less likely, not more likely. And that's the thing that kind of just goes, you know, gnaws at me when you, these things like, okay, to explain that, now you need a really impossible thing, which is the laws of physics have to be unknown to us, new laws that these things can uh-huh. manipulate, which again would be fascinating to me. But let me let me just double click on that for one second. It's often said that like the laws of physics lead to these new types of technology. At least that's kind of the syllogism that people are using, right? These aliens, if they invented, uh, if they had the laws of physics that permitted anti-gravity, right? Mm -hmm. That you could extract some technology from it. That technology, in turn, would be used to get to the Earth from Proxima Centauri. Right? Okay. That's sort of an an argument that Mm -hmm. would be used, right? It's a way to explain how they're here, right? Because our current laws with chemical rockets... And, and biological aging processes of DNA, right, do not permit us to get to any solar system, right? right? And we, so just using the, and that's the only life form we know exists. And that's the only physics we know exists, right? The known laws of physics by definition. Mm-hmm. So in order to get, so, but I ask you, did we use um, to get, uh, let's say the most advanced thing that humans have ever built in terms of laws of physics, um, let's just say it was the Trinity bomb, you know, it was the atomic bombs right. that were used, right? Did the scientists that were working it, you saw Oppenheimer, right? Yeah. So um, I did an explainer video just as a small advertisement because people were interested in the physics. There's almost no physics in that movie, right? Right. Uh, but so I did a video called The Physics of Oppenheimer. Or the professor explains the bomb. So if people are interested in the hardcore physics and the history of it, that they can find that. It's on, on your channel. YouTube channel? It's on my YouTube channel. Okay. So, um, but they, did they look at the laws of physics like were, was Oppenheimer was he a, a physicist in the sense that like he looked at the new laws of physics and then from those laws of physics came up with technology no or was he mostly an engineer like his remember the big process he put in the marbles and yeah, yeah, plutonium yeah, yeah. versus uranium um, it was a technology trouble it was a technology problem we had to create the Oak Ridge National Laboratory Hanford nuclear sites we had to do things to 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 produce a yielding like what Iran is doing now Iran is reputedly building a bomb right are they using the laws of physics are they going back to quantum mechanics and solving the Schrodinger equation no it's a technology problem right my point is it's not enough to say that like the laws of physics have to be uh, you know manipulated you also need a way of, of improving the laws of technology to extract those laws. It's often said, well, your computer screen, the internet in here, the camera sensors, those are based on uh, semiconductors. And they, it's true. Semiconductors are based on the laws of quantum mechanics. The very first transistor, nobody looked at the laws of Schrodinger, which is really what governs a transistor <laughs> equation um, and, and um, uh, more advanced statistical mechanics, but nothing like 
uh, group theory or string theory was needed, right? Right. But even they didn't use like the they didn't use the laws of physics to invent technology, which was the previous most advanced technology, maybe or actually it came after the nuclear bomb, right? Mm. So all this is just to say that um, having new laws of physics, I don't think it's even a necessary con- condition for aliens to be here or have new technology. It may not, it's certainly not a sufficient, you know, if you just had new laws of physics. And so, like I said earlier, if I told you string theory had been invented on Proxima Centauri B, um, you know, would it matter to you? Let me ask you this question. Let's say aliens invent metallurgy and chemical rockets, okay, that for some reason can advance them, you know, to very high velocities or their biology allows them to live for trillions of years, right? Mm-hmm. right? If I said they invented that, um, uh, would you say, well, they still have to invent string theory or they still have to invent, you know, warp theory or whatever Jack has or, uh, you know, in other words, what what was more important, the technology or the pure science, the applied science or the pure science for, for tra- teleporting the across applied the applied science. Exactly. So these things about the anti-gravity conference of Ed Witten's father in 1913, you know, so are these questions of, you know, relevance to the discovery of uh, evidence for aliens being here on Earth? I don't know. I, I don't know that it's so important. To, let's say they were doing anti-gravity research, whatever that Right. Means. We certainly don't have any anti-gravity technology right now. That I mean, can you point? Of. Yeah, flubber. I mean, I mean what, what, what uh, Fraver said that he saw, right? So that's, that sounds also, like anti-gravity. So I don't know anything about this. So Fravor, the pilot who witnessed with his eyes a Tic Tac, also has knowledge about, you sure it's Fravor and not Grush? I thought Fravor was the one who saw the Tic Tac. Yeah. Yeah. So he also claims that he saw that he has saw separate evidence. Or you're saying the existence of Tic Tac moving the way it did, is moving the way it did, that would be anti gravity, right? If it bent, bending space up. So if there was something in there, it would turn to gelatin if it was not anti gravity, right? If it could create a pocket where it just moves around and nothing is affected. Again, so this is this is uh, again synthesizing a whole bunch of claims that may or may not be related. Right? So <laughs> yeah. that he saw it, that it was witnessed by other sensors, that yeah. the sensors weren't spoofed, that the because uh, there are many ways to move. Like I can make something move, you know, uh, faster than the speed of light. You just give me a laser pointer, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I, I can do it. I can I can have a signal that you know ch- that changes faster that doesn't transmit information. That's right. just a visibility, right? right? Um, and who's to say that there's something inside there at all, exactly. right? Uh, and and by the way, you. You know, again, let's say these creatures are, are incredibly advanced. Do you think the first things that we sent to, um, well, we know for sure. They're definitely the f- not. They're drone. They're, 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 they're 3D printed there's things. Nothing they're not human. They're right. not biological. And the only thing that's biological in them are the fingerprints and the right. exhalation. I had Craig Ventner on, Ventner on, who is the man who, sent the, who sequenced the human genome for the first time 25 years ago. And he was saying there's already Mars is covered in human shit. <laughs> Because the, there's just like no way in the International Space Station and uh, all that when they you know, when they use the bathroom they vented to space and they found the outside of the space station is covered with the human microbiome oh <laughs> and then he studies that. so it's like already we've, we've contaminated it now my question is and I like to do this as a thought experiment what if I told you that there was life on another planetary system it's a it's a multi-planetary system like ours is okay so it's mm-hmm. a star system it has a type g2 sub dwarf yellow star just like our sun same size and it has two planets in the habitable zone you're familiar with the habitable zone the right? goldilocks zone goldilocks zone exactly i told you there's two planets there and good news uh, one is teeming with life, mm. life mm. everywhere, life in uh, underwater oceans, ice caps, uh, even in the atmosphere, there's life and, and so forth of this planet. Um, there's another planet we haven't had time to slew the James Webb telescope over to to take a peek. But um, we want to ask you, Danny, what's the odd? What are the odds that that object has life on it? The one right Just next life. door. Yeah. Not technology, not the. I iPhone. would say there's got to be there's got to be a high likelihihood of very high life on there, right? And so I, I submit to you, this is another gift for you. This is a wow. chunk of the of the moon. The moon. I gave Joe oh, Rogan oh, a wow. piece of Mars. I gave uh, Julian just a crappy meteorite. Oh, uh, I get a part of. You the get moon. a sliver of the moon, just because no I forgot. Way. Sorry, Julian. Thank you very much. Next time much, I see you, brother, Brian. I'm gonna do it. But Julian, you know that Danny let you have the first dibs on me. Uh, it was so beneficial. That's right. He I got let, such a bump. He, I he let Julian scoop me. That's right. He let you get the scoop. So I had to give him a little bit better Hanukkah Christmas present, okay? So <laughs> how, how did that get here? Besides me bringing in here, how do you think this thing is here? 
The moon? Yeah. How do you think that piece of the moon got here? Panspermia. Panspermia, right. So most people say, oh, you went to, you went to uh, Houston. And <laughs> if you do that, so if this were collected by an astronaut, I would be in jail now, and you would be an accessory to murder, oh, wow. and uh, Stephen up back behind the curtain would also go to jail. So you'd be accessory to felony, right? It's a felony to have own possession of a, of a fragment of the rocks that were collected by the Apollo astronauts. Oh, wow. But uh, NASA and the U.S. government doesn't control gravity. So where was this found? This is found in Northwest Africa. I'll send you a piece. Of, I'll send you some information. And how do you know it's part of the moon? So it's uh, the exact chemical composition has been acquired for it, and this is oh, what I want to do. It's been compared. Yeah. To the, okay. And so for your audience, I like to do a giveaway for your audience too. Uh, if you've made it this far, so go to BrianKeating.com. On my website, uh, there's a giveaway. I give away one chunk, sometimes of these moon rocks, but always every month I give away an actual meteorite. And of the meteorite, we had it chemically analyzed with X-ray fluorescent spectroscopy. Just blast it with X-rays. And you'll get a printout of the chemical fingerprint of these meteorites. Oh, wow. And if you have a .edu email address, so if you're in college or grad school or a professor or whatever, go to briankeating.com slash edu and you're guaranteed to win. So ordinary people that aren't in university, I'm trying to you know, kind of right, uh, right. give back to the university system. Um, so briankeating.com, other ones go there. And I'll send you the information about that and I can send you information about the moon rock that I sent, uh, gave to Danny, I can't give you any information about Uranus, though. That's a private moon. <laughs> so that got here by gravity, right? So yes. impacts hit the moon all the time. They impacted Mars. So I gave Joe Rogan. I gave him a piece of Mars. I have a chance. Oh, he Martian gets Mars. Meteor, right, yeah. I think he probably smoked it or something by now. Yeah, probably. But, uh, but the uh, Mars meteor, Mars, the Earth, the Moon, they all exchange material for right. billions of years now. So the fact that Mars is a cold, dead place, as far as we can tell, doesn't mean it was always cold and dead and, and lifeless, but it is in the habitable zone. Water can be in liquid form there. There's ice underneath. Uh, they actually think there's ice underneath the surface of, of Mars. Avi Loeb thinks there are caves with lava tubes wow. that could have... You know, he's like, there could be aliens in there. Yeah. Um, so all these things point to a very important conclusion, which is that the exchange of material throughout the solar system is ubiquitous. The lack of life should be used as some piece of evidence, not proof, but accounting for in the likelihood ratio test that I told you about earlier. Mm -hmm. You should be able to ascribe some probability to the lack of existence of life and its fecundity throughout the universe based on the non-observation and the only planet that we know could have had life in our solar system for sure. So, wow. Yeah. Um, so anyway, these things are great. They're fun to talk about. Um, I, I think it's it's always you know, uh, people get almost emotional in a religious capacity. They like, definitely do. People yeah. believe it, you know, and the, the core fiber of who they are is their identity. It's very hard to change someone's mm. identity. You know, if you've ever had a Jehovah's Witness come to your house, right? Or uh, I pass an LDS yeah. church on the way over yeah. here, right? Like, okay, I'm, I'm pretty thankful, you know, where I'm at right now. I don't need it. But if you say to them, you know, like, <laughs> tell me about aliens. I guess some, you know, Scientologist, maybe we shouldn't talk too much about right. it. It's around here, right? Isn't Clearwater not too far from here? Uh, we, we are literally 10 minutes away from the <laughs> headquarters of Scientology wow. where L. Ron Hubbard parked his pirate ship. His, his spaceship, right? Yeah. <laughs> To Tulu or whatever, yeah, you call them, right? Yeah, no, it is very religious, and even like I was talking, me and Steve were talking about yeah. it earlier. Like even people that are in like positions of authority in government, or even in NASA or or NRO or some of these agencies, a, a lot of them, because of their position or their where they are in the hierarchy and their the what they know, like the information that they have that's classified that no one else has, right? Mm -hmm. They sort of that is meaning in itself and if you are one of these people that i mean a lot of these really smart people are antisocial yeah and introvert in, INTJ. In, very high iq yeah. antisocial introverts and they know things that many people don't know you know you wake up eat, no matter what even if you're a plumber you got to prescribe some sort of a meaning to what you do to get up out of bed every day and some of these people at a very high level they think i've said it many times quoting my friend Paul Rosalie is they think their lives are the Da Vinci code. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And when you start to talk about aliens and the, and NASA and the moon being built by aliens and we only know what these things are, but you guys don't, it doesn't progress science or it doesn't progress humanity in any sort of real sense. Yeah. Right. It's threatening it's, to them when it, you try to take away or even question about their identity. It's mm -hmm. very threatening to and, yeah. and it's natural, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, by the way, if you want to know um how to tell when you do meet a scientist who's extroverted, do you know how to do that? How? 
uh, he'll talk to you and he'll look at your shoes when he talks to you. No. Oh. <laughs> then you know 100% he is extrovert. That's she, amazing. Or she. Right. Discriminate. Right? right. Well, I think your Uber's here. Brian, All right. thank you well, so buddy, much. This is for awesome. It's worth the wait. Podcast. <laughs> All the way from I'll come uh, back. San Diego. I'm back in town and see my friend Jordan. I got these stickers for you. Brian King. Oh, we got stickers. Cool. Yeah. QR code you know stickers. QR that. codes. You're watching out there. Get that. Yeah, yeah. Snap tell, this picture. You go right to the website. Tell everyone where to subscribe. I'll link your, your uh, YouTube channel and everything yeah, below. Just, uh, go to my YouTube channel. I got a couple books out and um, got a chat bot. I'm having a lot of fun with AI and trying to figure out uh, how to improve education. I want to bring the cost of education down 10x and and spread it to the masses because I do think you know the one way we're going to save the world is to have more science technology and engineering and math I don't think we're going to do it you know as great as you know gender studies is yeah. <laughs> as necessary as it is I don't think we're going to get you know, to a place of protection. And it may be, who knows, these aliens underneath the ocean, right? It may be that Mar uh, Musk is wrong, that we, well, it may be that he's right. We have to get off the surface of the planet, but maybe we have to do something to protect the planet that we're already on. I mean, it's a lot cheaper to save the planet you're on now than to try to find another planet somewhere else that you might be able to get to and die on the way, perhaps. Right. I mean, it's just to save ourselves from another Chicxulub or yeah, whatever. Yeah, that's right. Chicxulub, Chicxulub. Uh, Chicxulub, yeah. yeah. Another yeah. or a uh, younger Dryas <laughs> impact. Yes, like right. we want to make our, our species survive so we got to get ourselves off the planet and figure out how to terraform Mars so we can that's right live past all this and then when that's the, right. the and next then clean your anus when yeah. the next round of civilization rises on earth we'll come back in our spaceships and we'll confuse the shit out of them <laughs> awesome thank you brother thanks bro I appreciate it goodbye everybody <laughs>